we are going to talk about why women's leadership or what we've historically talked about as women's leadership might actually be for everyone. And I'm really excited to get into that conversation. Uh, I am Jennifer Simpson. I know several of you, but not all of you. And so um, if we haven't met, please do connect with me. I'd love uh, to be in conversation. Really, I started this work. I wrote this book to start a series of conversations about how we work today and how we want to be working into the future. Uh, I've been doing some version of leadership management consulting and designing organizations and cultures for going on 30 years now. And I made a really intentional decision some number of years ago that I didn't want to work anymore with people that I had to convince that how we were doing things was bad or broken or could be better. And instead, I wanted to go find the people who shared a vision for work that was more human-centered, that really believed that our best work, our most creative work comes from uh, really being able to be uh, in creativity with one another through our differences, to find creative solutions to intractable problems. And so I developed the Cohen Method out of this set of principles that really part of what allows us to discover breakthroughs is a willingness to be just a little uncomfortable, just a little bit longer than we'd like to be, to sit in that discomfort of not knowing long enough to discover something that we don't already know. And this Cohen concept also then really serves as a way of thinking about what I think we're trying to build in the future, which are organizations and communities that are kinder, more open, able to be more adaptive and resilient, and that we relate to as networks of relationship and community. And so this process really allows us to have a different quality of conversation. And I find that when we take any question that we feel stuck around and we bring these principles to it, we get curious in a new way and bring a fresh dose of empathy to it. We open up the conversation by pointing at the elephant in the room, naming a piece of the issue that perhaps has been unspoken or shining a bright light on something that hasn't had as much transparency around it, we discover new things. And that from there, we can unstick the things that have had us stuck and really discover in the process that we're not alone in solving for it, that we're able to tap into the networks of support that are all around us. And so over the course of this year, uh, we're picking a range of topics to have these kinds of conversations about and today I'm joined by um, my longtime friend, Denise. I think we met a decade or so ago now and have uh, both sat in circle doing our own women's leadership development work together um, and gotten to collaborate on all sorts of interesting things. And so, Denise, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the group and just tell them a little bit about your journey and your relationship to women's leadership. Wow. <clears throat> you know, I'm so used to people doing the introductions of me that when I'm asked to introduce myself, it feels so weird. But in all of my classes, I say to the individuals participating in the class that one of the most powerful things you can do is introduce yourself. So I am Denise Harrington, and I've been doing my work for about 30 years as well. My focus has always been on communication and how to present brand presence talking to the media, dealing with crisis communication. About 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago, I started doing work around the idea of women's leadership. And it's interesting, I don't want to take away from some of the questions that I know that might come up, but I was at the time really doing a lot of work around communication skills and doing a lot of my work in Silicon Valley. And there were never, hardly ever, believe it or not, women in those meetings. It's amazing. And then I had a woman come to me who was at Intel and she really wanted to move up the ranks in her company. She wanted to go from a director and begin to be a senior director at some point, VP, maybe even C-suite. And she was getting shot down all the time because 
the way that she was being, she thought was what was going to get her ahead. And she was utilizing skill sets that were more conducive to the way men lead. And it wasn't working for her. So it's interesting that out of that came all of my leadership work around women and how to help women close the gap between the way that they communicate leadership and the way that men communicate leadership. It's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. So that's me. Excellent. Thanks, Denise. Um, so many interesting aspects of Denise's background to unpack. You can see some of the amazing organizations she's worked with here on the screen, and I know she'll be happy to talk more about those in the in our question time if you've got any specific questions. But first, we want to get to know you a little bit. We really have designed these to be conversations. And so I'm going to interview Denise a little bit. I've got a bunch of questions that I want to use to get the conversation going. But first, I want to hear from all of you, what brought you here today? Um, what was it about this topic that felt interesting or compelling to you? And feel free to enter that into the chat, um, or I'm going to stop sharing right now and would love for a few of you to um, come on camera, raise your hands, um, and speak your interest into this space. Jonathan, what brought you here? Yeah, well, I just thought it was such an interesting and unique topic because uh, oftentimes I'm looking at events and whatever, and I wonder myself uh, if if I'm able to join and and support uh, uh, women networking events and things like this, uh, even if it's at, at Ally. And I just love the framework that it's for everyone and, and unique, and, and wanted to learn more. Beautiful. Thank you. And thanks for being here. Who else? My pleasure. What drew you? Lynn Marie? Hi. Yeah. The, this whole like discomfort, like discomfort with discomfort dynamic, I'm very present to that. And mm -hmm. also I am very present to like there are different rules for men and women in the workplace. And um, that as women and as men who are advocates for women, I love the idea of us coming together and seeing how we navigate it. And maybe it's not something we can change, but maybe it is something that we can improve and acknowledge and accept and find a path mm -hmm. to progress through that dynamic. And we don't, I don't believe we have to be the same. I just think we have to be aware. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of what we're finding is that some of the things that have characterized men's leadership are not the most effective ways of leading in the world that we're in today. And so there really is a lot to learn from this, you know, 50 years of women having been in the workforce and emerging into leadership in interesting ways. Yes. And um, what's your first name? You just oh, have Haley. H. Sorry, Haley. Yes. Haley. Sorry, yes. I have for, for another okay. HRSA. Yes. For another HRSA event, I had the whole, my grant name. Um, so I'm, I'm interested. Um, I also, I work on a program and I also teach gender and different things related to that. So I'm really interested in kind of the complexity also of how power works around leadership. And I feel like for um, you know, we can class things into like masculine and feminine, and also we can like look at things in terms of who's had power and who doesn't, and that can be kind of similar. And I think that the idea of who's traditionally had power and leadership is really different to maybe what would work better. And so I'm really interested in seeing how you might map some of those ideas out. Yeah, absolutely. So many interesting dynamics to unpack there. Beautiful. Well, with that, Nancy, I saw one you. More. Hey. Yes, hi. Yeah, hi, please. Denise. It's Nancy. We met years ago when I first came to Portland. It's great to see you. Jen, thanks for hosting this. Um, I have a number of interests in being here, obviously, because I love and adore both of you and what's the work you're doing. I love knowing this relationship. I love the centering of female leadership in this. Um, it feels like your title is hearkening to Bell Hooks' work, Why Feminism is for Everyone. Um, and so I'm about the tie-in as we think about what it means to center um, female leadership, ways of knowing, 
um, in in the work of in my for my work is the work around healing, but it's very much around ending the effects of domination by by male patterns and by patriarchy, which have led to the destruction of the planet. Um, and and it's not inherent to men. I want to be really clear. Um, but there is a deep hurt there, and I'm I'm so curious to get your take on this. So that's why mm. I'm here. Beautiful. And Julie you. gave you a heart. Julie gave you a heart, and I love discovering connections within my connections. So I love that you and <laughs> Denise know each other already. Um, so let's dive in. Um, Denise, I'm going to spotlight you and me. There we go. And I really encourage everyone throughout this conversation to do two things. First, if an idea uh, strikes your interest and you're like, oh, that's really interesting, just type it in the chat as a note. Um, that way it'll get added into the recording. And it's also really helpful for other people on the call to know that something is resonating with other folks. Uh, and then secondly, if questions come up, please feel free to enter those into chat. Um, clarifying questions, things you want us to elaborate on, we'll field those in real time. And um, Nick and a few of my other colleagues are also sort of theming questions in the background so we can uh, dive into those at the end. So Denise, as you know, when we first talked about having this conversation, this idea of if it's women's time to lead now, what do we need to be doing to get ready? is part of what we were grappling with, right? What does it really mean to seize the moment, to be ready to step into leadership in a different way? And so I think the first thing I would ask you is what does women's leadership mean to you? And how has that meaningfulness maybe evolved in um, the years that you've been working with women leaders? Four questions in one, yay! <laughs> what does it mean to me, women's leadership, and also what if it's our time to lead, then what is it that we do to prepare? I think that they're two important and separate, so let's separate them out. Yeah. What does women's leadership mean? Well, to me, it means that it's time for us to lead. To, I believe that leadership is out of balance that the, the scale has tipped all the way over to the male model being in a place where personally I feel it's a little out of control. And you don't have the diversity sitting at the table, the diversity of perspective, the diversity of different ways to lead, the diversity of collaborative ways to lead, which are some of the ways that women tend to be in relationship. So why do I say in relationship? Because leadership is really all about relationship. It's about how you inspire people. It's not a tactical thing. Leadership is not tactical. Leadership is more emotional. It's more inspirational. It's how you bring people together, how you help to value the people that you work with, and how you help to sh help them shine their own lives. This is something that I feel women's leadership, the backbone of that, it's what we do. <clears throat> I, I, in the beginning years when I first did my very first women's leadership summit, we really talked about the characteristics that women have that are different from men. And one of the biggest characteristics that we have that's so appro appropriate for leadership is relationship. That's our mantra. It's very hard to separate a woman out from relationship. Relationship is so important to us. And it's the way that we see life, it's the way we do life, it's the way we inspire life. Well, how is that different from a man? It's not like a man doesn't understand relationship. It's not their primary purpose. It's not the thing that absolutely drives them. Women are driven by relationship. And I know that's a generalization, but I think you could probably get a raise a hand right now and every woman in here in the last couple of seconds was thinking about some kind of relationship, whether it's with their with their baby, their mother, their father. We think and live and breathe relationship. Well, why is that important to leadership? 
it's hilarious that when I first started doing work in communication, part of what I would do because I was working with so many sales people was I was trying to help men understand how to do relationship selling. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. If, you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, why not invite into or to the table more women who naturally go in that direction, who can inspire the men around them to begin to see relationship in a different way as it relates to a product, an idea. How does the person you're selling to, how do you create a bridge to relationship? So that's why I feel it is our time. It's our time to one, bring this pendulum back into balance where the male experience, the male model is alive, but the female model of, of leadership is alive and vibrant too. Mm. That's so beautifully said. And, you know, you said this is a generalization and I just want to name that, you know, we're talking about men and women. We understand that biology and gender are not the same thing and that it exists on a continuum. And that a lot of what we've learned about leadership particularly over these last 30 to 50 years of having more women in the workforce, women identified humans in the workforce, um, has been through a fairly binary lens. A lot of the research on leadership that exists looks at leadership, which generally means male leadership, or looks at women's leadership, which has been a particular kind of leadership. And we really are just starting to unpack how these things show up in individual human lives. And I think for me, part of the spirit of women's leadership being for everyone is acknowledging that some of what we've learned works well about leading has come from studying this sort of new crop of women leaders, right? We've sort of distilled their leadership behaviors and we've talked about it as women's leadership. But effectively, what we're finding is empathetic, relational leadership that cares about people and is rooted in good listening is what makes better leaders. And so, Denise, I'm really interested as you've watched this journey evolve over the last several decades, how the idea of women's leadership and women's role in leadership has changed. Like, how are we having different conversations today than we were 10 or 20 years ago? I don't know if the word change is the right word. I think it's acceptance. I think more people are accepting that women bring a unique brand of leadership to the table. I think it's acceptance. I think it's acknowledging, acknowledging that, oh, she's doing it a little bit different than the way it's been done. You see, there's been a paradigm that's been in place, and we all have had to step into that paradigm, males as well as females. The difference between women stepping into that paradigm, and this will be like a silly little analogy, the difference between women stepping into the male paradigm is that we had to adopt the male way of being. Example. When I first started teaching communication skills in San Francisco, I went into the first day into this corporate environment where I was a part of a big team that taught communication skills. The clothing of the day for a woman in business was we had to wear the jacket, the skirt, the little tie, you all may not know that because you may not have been born by then, but the little tie, it was, it was the flip side or the replica of the male model on a woman. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And the day that I was able to actually put on a pair of pants with that jacket was, I felt like so liberated. <laughs> the day that I was able to get rid of the white shirt with the little bow tie and add a wonderful silk blouse that had color to it was the day of liberation. So that's what I mean by we, it's not change, the change has happened, but I think it's a recognition and an ownership of self. 
in order for us to truly create that balance, it does take acceptance on all levels of where women have come from, where and men accepting the fact that they've been able to hold a certain way of being and to open up the door to bring in this new way of being so that everyone benefits from it. Hmm. Because everyone will benefit from the balance of leadership. <clears throat> men can use what we bring to the table and we've had a little longer time to use what men brought to the table we've had to adapt more which is why i love this whole thing about adaptiveness women have had to adapt a little bit more than men so the mm -hmm. way that women coming to the table can help balance is helping men to adapt to an, an alternative way of leadership that will bring balance to the pattern of leadership that has been in place for eons, it seems like, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Eons, absolutely. <laughs> Ice <laughs> ages have come and gone. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, when I when I reflect on some of those changes, and I mean, I have my whole long list of my own horror stories involving, you know, nail painting and pantyhose and, <laughs> you know. And, you know, we didn't coordinate our attire this morning, but we both showed up wearing our blazers, right? And so mm -hmm. there are parts of that, this that get entrained. And as you were talking about the sort of trajectory over these last few years, I really see this evolution that's happened, right? Where in the 50s and 60s, it was just, okay, if you get through the door, you follow their rules, right? Like you get through the door and whatever the rules and expectations of the workplace are, like that's what you do. And then like a decade in, it's like, okay, well, maybe I can bring a little bit of my own personality to the way things already are. And then somewhere around the 80s or the 90s, you get women who've been in organizations for a long enough time that this sort of style of women's leadership and bringing our whole selves and starting to think about authentic purpose-driven leadership becomes part of the organizational vocabulary. And it feels like now we're at a place where we can say, okay, now how do we reimagine how we do all of this for all of us? right? That it's not about changing the rules inside the existing system anymore, but we now have an opportunity. And frankly, I think the pandemic has accelerated our opportunity because it broke so many of the hard and fast rules of how things had to be done organizationally, that we've got a little bit of a chance to throw things up in the air and say, well, what if we tried that instead? And so- I'd love to hear you think, and then I want to start getting the audience back into the conversation a little bit around what we've learned over this last, you know, half century works best, right? So when we say that women's leadership is for everyone, what are the leadership skills? What is the style or the approach that if more people adopted that brand of leadership, our organizations might thrive differently? Well, it's still balanced as far as I'm concerned, because when you start to talk about adapting or bringing in women's leadership, what are the characteristics and how does everyone take on those characteristics? You first have to be open. Now the word for change comes in. You have to be open for change. And uh, to be honest, if I were a man, and I were living the life I've been living for however many years I've been on the face of the earth, the paradigm, the male paradigm has worked for me. Woohoo! It has. When you start to bring in the idea of allowing women's way of being leadership to the table and having a male take that on if our goal is balance, balanced perspective, balanced voice, balanced way of being, it's a, it's a change. There has to be a behavioral change that has to happen. And I think just the nature of bringing someone to the table. Let me give you an example. I was doing a training in women's leadership at Nike. And at the time, I remember I had well, I was actually doing communications training. I wasn't doing women's training. I was doing public speaking. Mm -hmm. 
And I was sitting in a room, and of course, we were, it was all men. There may have been two women there. Interesting, huh? And this baby carriage came by. You know, it was one of those carriages that you put like six kids in and, you know, here they come in front of the, they have this little lake on campus and here come the babies from the daycare center. And I have to say, all the guys kind of stopped and looked and started marveling and having a conversation about, boy, that must be cool to be able to go around campus in this, this baby, big baby carriage. Now. If there hadn't been an opportunity for women to come to work and to bring their children, which, by the way, this started in during World War II when women were building the ships, they had to create daycare because women had to bring their children to work. So that whole concept of bringing children into the workplace in and of itself began to change the perception of the men in that room. They had to take a moment and really get into it and allow their hearts to open up. Maybe one of their kids was in, you know, one of their children was in the the stroller. That's where it happens. It happens by the fact that women are at the table. And then everyone at the table, specifically the men that are there, need to open up and accept that kind of change. The ability to adapt by listening. You brought that up by respecting, by observing, and in, incorporating a new way of seeing life mm -hmm. in the corporate world or anywhere, in any world mm -hmm. for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I really hear you pointing again back at that sort of relational connected quality, right? Recognizing that this isn't a transaction. I'm not here to you know, exert my force of will in the world through you and your being, right? Like that's not the job of leadership. The job of leadership is to free you to, uh, to bring the full expression of your gifts into the world, right? So that we all yeah. might discover something different together. And let us, let it wash over you. That's what I mean by openness. Let that difference wash over you by accepting it by acknowledging it, that it's sitting at the table. And that's why I brought up that men have an advantage because there's this way of being that has existed in corporate America. But that doesn't say by the nature of them interacting with more often and inviting more women to the table, that it won't wash over them and create this balanced perspective in life, which is going to enrich every thing that we put mm -hmm. our fingers on. Every success that a company really is going after has to come from the innovative value of different perspectives, male, female, black, white, gay, not gay. All of it is going to create a different perspective that will be a win for the leadership and the organization. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, to tie back to um, the comment that there's a connection to Bell Hooks's book, you know, I've got feminism is for everyone on my shelf right over there. And like the spirit of that is that inequality is fundamentally bad for everyone, right? That yeah. when things are out of balance, you know, even if your side of the seesaw happens to be up today, you're always at risk of coming crashing down. Right. And that sort of when we build a win lose world, the only way that works is for there to be many more losers than winners. And so if we're designing a win lose world, we're designing a world that has more people sad and disappointed than elated most of the time. Right. And so when you say it like that, it sounds crazy, but yet. That is how we design so much of our lives. And there are just decades of research now that shows that, you know, people don't leave jobs, they leave managers, that creating conditions of psychological safety on a team is where creativity and innovation are born, that creating conditions for participation and voice creates better organizational outcomes, that more diverse leadership teams produce better results. Like there's no conflict in the research and yet the needle's not moving that fast. 
And so I'm no. curious, what do you think keeps us stuck? Why do we keep doing the things we know don't work when we have evidence that other things work better for all of us? Well, I'm doing a little chuckle over here. It's because it's like driving down 95. That's the that's the big highway here between Washington, D.C. and New York is 95. And you, you know how it feels to be on a road and you slip into this kind of rut that's there, groove that's there. You'd rather be on the, the new side of the road that they just paved, but you have to pass so you get back into this rut. It's the rut. There was a question that was on here. What is keeping us stuck in old patterns, in old habits and old patterns? And forgive me guys it's not this is not a personal statement but it's the male model it's the model that we are used to living in it even where i've had a couple of people that i've coached that are women that will sit at the table they're at the table you know how long we've been trying to get to the table right they're at the table and still will not exercise their voice won't raise their hands and then they go outside and they talk to another woman and they go, well, I noticed X, Y, Z, blah, 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 to each other, but they didn't say it in the room because that model, that pattern had an effect on us as women that keeps us from utilizing our voice, our voice. Then when she went back into, and this was woman was, was a candidate for VP. She went back into the room and she just kind of said to herself, darn it, I'm just going to stop this craziness that's going on inside of me. And she raised her hand and said, blah, 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 which changed the whole direction of the organization. And it was a direction they needed to go in. Mm -hmm. So it's a level of adapting, accepting on all sides. Some of my staunchest supporters have been male because they saw my abilities, they knew what I brought to the table and they wanted that to be a part of their team. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we're going no to the guys, we're just saying be aware that there is a pattern there and what can we all do by interacting and letting that experience wash over us and help us begin to transform and change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love that. So, I want to ask you one more question and then I'm going to open it up to the group and we'll sort of expand the conversation from here. So if you've got any questions that are starting to bubble, I encourage you to drop those into the chat um, and know that we're coming for your questions in just a second. <laughs> um, uh, Denise, I, I wonder if you can help us imagine what the different future might look like if we can get ourselves unstuck and find this balance what would actually look or feel different what could we accomplish from that place that might say oh maybe that is worth the effort to get into the passing lane yeah yeah it's knowing that you're in the passing lane and knowing that you can get out that's a big part mm -hmm. of it. Mm. Uh, uh, the way to do that when you go into that rutted lane because it, these are these are habits that we're having to get rid of on both sides of the fence. Women are bringing a different way of looking at and a different pattern. Men are bringing a certain pattern that's already established and they're looking at a new way of doing it. It's about learning how to use the muscle. And the only way you can really even learn how to use the muscle is to recognize where you are and who you are. What are your characteristics? What are the things that make you valuable? And that's, that work should be done by women and men. And perhaps once women get clear about what that is and what are some of the things that are old patterns that we need to release, and guys on the other side, what are the old patterns that we need to at least be aware of? Maybe they work for us. Notice I said women release, men notice what works for us, but also be open because it's the patterns that are holding us stuck. That's what it is. Being centered has a lot to do with being aware. 
that's why I love your book, truly, mm. Jennifer, because it's based on Buddhist principles. And usually those kinds of principles are rooted in the idea of being centered in self, mm. understanding the self value. Women, if, if we're going to change anything about women bringing leadership to the table, it's about understanding your self worth and being rooted in that. So that when you go into a circumstance where, you know, all the guys are talking and, and believe me, there are some women who say, I put up an idea, I finally got my hand up and then they took it as if it was theirs. Mm -hmm. These are things that we have to share so that guys know what they're doing to step on our toes. And we have to understand how our toes are being stepped on. Mm -hmm. And then when that happens, we can begin to create the kind of centeredness that's important and the recognition of the value that both sides bring to the table. That's the only way we're going to create that balance. And I think it's the only way to change. It's also one last thing that I think is real important. Centeredness usually brings a certain level of consciousness. Being conscious of what you're doing. Intentional, they're calling it nowadays. It's all about intentional. intentionality. When you go mm -hmm. into the... Yes. When you go into that corporate room, guys, now go in with the and to see what the women in the room bring to the table. Ladies, when we go into the room, sit there with the intention of understanding when that pattern is running and how you can raise your hand and break the pattern. It's going to take work, but it comes from being centered, intentional, and owning that value within yourself. Yeah, I love that. I mean, part of what you're saying is it's just inertia, right? Like it's inertia and momentum that sort of keeps us going down the road. And this idea of presence, right? The idea of being grounded, rooted in the present moment, I think can really help us break out of that because in the present, it's not a groove. It's just a point, right? Like in this moment, it's just a point. And then in the next moment, it's just a point. And it's really easy to decide, like, do we want this point or do we want that point? And it, as long as it's not feeling like a rut or a groove, I think we feel an experience of choice in a different way. And so for me, part of this work also comes from recognizing that just because the past has been what it is, doesn't mean that the future has to look exactly the same. And that it's the choices we make in this moment and the next moment and the one after that, that actually build the future. And yeah. we all have a say in that to some degree. So I love to open it up to the rest of the group. And um, I'm going to take us off spotlight, Denise, so that we can be part of the crowd with everybody. Um, and would love uh, either reflections. I see some great ones coming through uh, the chat and, and or questions yeah, that you have for us. Hey. Who's got a question or a reflection for us? What's, what's resonating for you in this conversation? Derry. Uh, Although I raised my hand, I'm happy to yield to someone else to speak first. I just you want to... have the floor. It is yours. Oh, okay. Um, well, hey Jen, uh, Denise, hello to you. Um, all right. So my question is having to deal with like the political realm, actually the the particular context of the pre the presidential realm. Um. Gosh, although I could provide some, some. Thanks concept. for starting with the easy things. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I just, I, I just, uh, every election year, I find myself pondering very deeply the, the temperature or the the climate of the nation, and, um, and I just, uh, there's so many ways I could go about what I want to like ask. But I guess when you think about, you know, women's leadership, can you just put it in the context of of a national, federal, like presidential or political realm? Can you speak to that? Because I just, mm. I'm just, I'm just I want to see where Diane, where Denise is going to go with this question before I wade in. So, well, I guess, 
here's a way to access what my what I'm sitting with is. Why isn't America ready for a woman president? And what would make America ready for that? Softballs over to you, Denise. Oh, I, your audio is, I lost your audio. Well, I think my audio is a little, is it, is it, is it lagging a bit? Is it it's lagging, lagging a bit. Side? You're caught or up you now. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's something going on. It's your fault. <laughs> but let me just see. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. Now I'm caught up. Am I caught up? Yes. So, I usually don't like to start out with so, but I do have to start out with so with this answer. The whole thing is the male paradigm is on steroids. It's out of balance right now that's what's going on it's just on steroids it's like everything that is that whole push that lack of relationship that dif being different divisive all of that <laughs> stuff is is crazy right now now again this is a generalization not every man on the planet is like that but the energy the paradigm is out of balance, way out of balance. Now, from a more center perspective, we all know in order to come sometimes back to center, you have to go all the way over to the left or the right to begin to see how you're out of balance. So until more people recognize how we're out of balance, the sooner there'll be a need or desire or a real support of female energy coming into balance. The interesting thing, I just went to a meeting about a week ago with, and I walked in, talk about at the table. You know, I'm always talking about seat at the table, seat at the table, and we're always thinking, you know, seat at the table with men. I walked into this long conference table of women and all of them were high powered women. Every last one of them were either C-suite or close to C-suite. And I felt a little bit intimidated by women. But the good news about being at that particular table is that the collective, the strength of that was all women. And they were talking about what it meant to be a woman leader and how they could create the next woman president, how they could create it. That by itself is pretty powerful because mm -hmm. that conversation will ultimately lead to another woman being nominated as and actually winning the presidency. But what it takes, I believe, I hate to put the onus on women, but I believe it takes a lot of women getting to the top of wherever you are if you own your own business, getting your face out there more often, getting people to see your power. Mm -hmm. And when more people see the power, more people are used to the power and won't feel intimidated by the power that women bring to the table. Because the paradigm has always seen us being kind of behind the scenes. And, but now we have these women who are stepping up and are really leading. It's all about step into your power women it is our time but you got to step into that power and start to be more visible in your presence and that's what's going to bring this crazy little off kilter thing back into balance i believe it is possible but i do believe that the onus is on women standing in their power hmm. yeah i heard a couple things in what you just said denise that i just want to really underscore Good. i think i mean the first piece of that is to just Good. reinforce representation matters right and that 
seeing yourself in leadership and seeing different models of leadership is part of what gives people courage, right? Part of what gives people permission to step forward and try something else. And and I do think we're having a different conversation today than we were 25 years ago. I mean, the people sitting around that table you just described have 25 years of experience in very senior influential roles that they didn't have 25 years ago, right? And there weren't tables like that 25 years ago that had that collection of women with that level of influence. And again, this isn't about women and men per se. It's really about taking what we're learning about leading humans toward a, what I like to call common good, um, that enables us to all adopt these behaviors. I think part of the challenge is that we've spent a lot of time trying to find common ground, right? And I think oftentimes that leads us to these sort of least common denominator solutions where we don't actually get to the root of the issue. We come up with something that no one can disagree with, but we don't actually make anyone happy and we don't actually untangle the problem. Whereas when we really start thinking about what are the solutions that are good for all of us, it it calls on a different kind of creativity, right? We've got to get innovative and imaginative in different ways. And Derry, the other piece that your question brought up for me is, I think part of what will have us be ready is when we relate to winning differently, right? That sort of win-lose mentality, we've got to think differently about what it means to win. And as long as we relate to winning as this individual thing that I have, if you don't, we're always going to have imbalance. But if we can enlarge our notion of winning to really think about solutions in the common interest for the common good, then the strategies that get us there have to be different, right? And so what leadership looks like and what good leadership looks like start to look different. Um, I just want to thank you too for responding to the question. I realize that the question is pretty, you know, all over the place and pretty action packed. So thanks for uh, responding to the question about when now there's buyer leadership. beware. <laughs> Indeed. Deep. Other reflections or questions? Buyer beware about the idea of winning. Say more, Denise. Yeah. No question. Lynn Marie, you well, looked like you're about I wanted to say, to say something. Buyer be fair when it comes to winning. Because generally speaking, in my coaching when I'm working with women, they feel like they that that whole hmm. Lynn Marie, I can't hear you. Hmm. How is that? Now we can hear you. <laughs> it's always technical. I, I was just going to say, I'm trying to fill in all the gaps, but like I have a visceral reaction to the word winning because to me, you know, like, I guess the traditional masculine or patriarchal paradigm is hierarchical versus relational. Um, and winning is kind of binary. And if there, if there's a winner, there are losers. And so I kind of feel like that is, is not feminine leadership. Winning is not feminine. Progress 
is feminine. Like being right is to me is a little bit more masculine and getting it right is more feminine. Like it's more inclusive, not that men can't apply those, those strategies, you know, those traditionally more feminine strategies that, you know what, you know, we, I can go fast alone or we can go far together kind of perspective. And so for me, winning is the antithesis of that. And winning, again, to your point that you made earlier, Jennifer, it's like contextual. It's a moment in time. And then it's done. It's gone. It's not enduring because tomorrow there's going to be a different winner. It's probably not going to be you. And so that was just because you called me out. I thought I would share that. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, and I sort of use that provocation intentionally. We might need a whole new word. We might just need to think about success differently or what, what a good outcome means. Right. But that however it is that we're valuing that positive outcome today, like we're ascribing so much value to the winner, right. To the individual who gets to sit atop the pile until someone topples them, right? Because that's what it means to sit atop the pile is that someone's got a target on your back and they're coming for you, right? And if we want to shift that dynamic, we've got to find a way of thinking about success in a much more holistic, inclusive, communal kind of way. Yeah, I just want to jump in on that because I, where I'm really connecting is when the two of you are talking about some of the tensions um, that exist in society. And I think I'm, I'm resonating mainly when we can hold the best of both. So when it's relationship and results. And I feel like at times we're holding both in this conversation and it times becomes relationships are good and results are bad, <laughs> which is to me, it's it's not holding the both, both sides of the polarity. It's doing what exactly what Denise described is going to the negative end of one so you can see the positive of the other, which as we all know, just kind of creates this back and forth. So what I'm really energized by is um, how we bring traditional kind of more qualities associated with women's leadership around connectivity and inclusion and um, is more of that equal playing field people were talking about, as well as focusing on results and getting things done, being effective. And I would say for me, sometimes winning. <laughs> like to me, winning isn't bad. You can win as a team. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I just wanted to give a little pitch for the uh, holding both on the polarities. Yeah, I, no. Oh, and sometimes I, can I think win. we're getting into a dichotomy. Can win. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. you for speaking so that. And I... I I absolutely don't want to give any impression that we're saying results don't matter. I actually believe you get better results when you lead from the heart and recognize that you're leading people, not machines, and that we create the conditions for people to really bring their best ideas forward, right? Like that's when we actually create the conditions for the best results. And so I think that's the model of leadership that we want more people regardless of gender identification, um, to embody. Denise, I think our, our audio was a little mismatched at the beginning. Do you have anything you want to add? I don't, I think I'm, I'm on now, right? Am I on now? Yeah. Yeah. When we started to talk about the win lose thing, my little mm. antenna started going wacky wonky because what happens when it's what Lynn was saying earlier and also Sally. It, what happens when we bring up win to women is that we kind of freak out because we don't know where to place our ability to be competitive. Women are very competitive, just in a different way than men. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that we can't lead teams to win. It Absolutely. just means our perspective in winning is rooted in relationship. Mm. So what does that mean? It means that when we are setting a goal to win, we look at it as a collaborative and not just a one-off. And when you're looking at winning from a collaborative, then what happens is you think about the people around you and how they can help 
you win as a team. That's the beauty of the kind of leadership women bring to the table. And that's why it's so powerful. That's what I mean by, you know, take a look at what we're bringing to the table. Let me give you an example. I have a daughter that's very competitive. She has her eyebrows are up right now because she's on the other side of the screen. But when she ran track in high school, in high school, it was early, not high, yeah, early high school. She had a friend, they ran together, different styles, but her friend had just gone through some things in her life. And we were watching the two of them running. They were doing a, both were doing the 100 meter dash. And then I think this was like a 400 meter or 200 meter dash. I can't remember. And what happened was at some point I saw Nia pull up and slow down and then her friend ran right by her and won the race and now me being a competitive mom i'm thinking what the heck what did you do and i asked her i said why did you pull up and she said mom she needed the win more than i did that's women's competitive leadership Our leadership is based on relationship. It's based on the whole, not the parts. The parts are contributing as a whole. If you think about that concept by itself, there's room for Black, there's room for Latino, there's room for gay, there's LGBTQ, there's male, there's there's everything that makes up the, what we call the dessert of the whole. And that's the kind of leadership, to your point, Derry, that is going to get not only our political system back in balance, but it will bring the world leadership back in balance, too. Isn't that a great story? That feels like a really beautiful note to close on. So um, for those of you who can make it, I hope we'll see you in April for a next conversation. Um, My friend and colleague, Mark McBride Wright, does um, heart-centered human-first leadership for engineers, Um, having lived as a gay man in the engineering field for decades, um, has really developed an approach to working in this heavily male-driven environment that will bring many of the principles we talked about today um, forward. So I hope you'll come back for that um, and hope that you will keep up with the conversation and stay um, Uh, part of this family, part of the growing Cohen Conversation Network. Uh, I really appreciate everyone who showed up today. I love the comments that you're all sharing in the chat. So um, energizing, provocative, connected relationship. We're really looking forward to continuing to be in conversation with all of you um, in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you so much for making time for this with all of us today.